It is in this nature of what is to be in its being its own notion that logical necessity in general consists. This alone is the rational element and the rhythm of the organic whole. It is as much knowledge of the content as the content is the notion and essence. In other words, it alone is speculative philosophy. The self-moving concrete shape makes itself into a simple determinateness. In so doing, it raises itself to logical form and exists in its essentiality. Its concrete existence is just this movement and is directly a logical existence. It is for this reason unnecessary to clothe the content in an external logical formalism. The content is in its very nature the transition into such formalism, but a formalism which ceases to be external, since the form is the innate development of the concrete content itself. In this section, number 56, and in several of the ones that are going to immediately follow, Hegel is telling us about necessity again, and also telling us why it's, it, it's not only not needed, but a bad idea to approach all of these, these matters that the phenomenology is going to be a phenomenology, that is a, a viewing, a sort of systematic uh, watching and putting, putting these things together. Um, why it's a bad idea to approach this in a formalist, schematic way, as we've seen him reject before. So, why is that? He's saying that logical necessity, and first I have the English, then I have the, the German here. Logical necessity, as such, consists in some way in a being, being its own notion. And, you know, there's one of those, those phrases where we say, well... I got you up to this point, what are you actually talking about here? And it's tempting, very often, I know this temptation myself, when you get, you know, where Hegel's going in general, and you, you understand bits and pieces of the, of the systematic approach that seem very attractive, um, and you want to get to later chapters where, you know, more is going on, to say, well, you know, I don't really get this, but I'm sure it'll become clear as I go along, and then never come back to it. So we don't want to do that here. Making it even more murky, I've, I've got the actual German for it up, and it's sort of a tongue twister. Um, in seinem sein, sein Begriff zu sein. This is what it is for a thing to actually, um, uh, you know, express or, or entail logical necessity. In seinem sein, that is, in its being, sein Begriff, its notion translated here, or its concept, zu sein, to be. Uh, so, to, for its being, to be its concept. And I think if you put it that way, it becomes a little bit more clear now. What this is saying is, logical necessity is where being and concept are finally, if not uh, coinciding, because sein here doesn't have to be, to be doesn't have to be seen as a pure identity statement, but rather to say that these are actually aligned with each other in such a way that the, the concept reveals to us the being, the being is revealing itself through our very engagement with it through the concept. And the concept is not related to the being in, a, in an arbitrary way, but in a necessary way. Um, it is expressing what it is for that being to be, which is for it to be the kind of being that it is, the, the concept of that being. Hopefully that's, you know, totally clear now. Uh, probably not, though, right? So it says... Um, this is what speculative philosophy really consists of. He tells us a few other things that help us sort of fill in, you know, the gaps on, on this. He says, the content is the notion and the essence. So, so what it is that, you know, the being is, its content, um, 
what we can say about it, what we can know about it, is the, this notion, this, this systematic grasp, and the essence. When, we, when we've actually you know, made it to figuring out what something is, we are grasping its essence. Um, the content that we're, we're engaged in, in knowledge of the content as well, and these two in, the, in, in one sentence are connected together. So knowledge of the content involves this being the case, that the content is the notion and the essence. Um, we don't want to say, well, therefore, knowledge is of the, the concept, because it's a little bit more tricky than that. Um, why? Well, because what he's calling shapes here, translating the term gestalt, Self-moving, concrete, uh, or no, it's, it's actually singular, sorry. Uh, self -moving, the the self-moving concrete shape makes itself into a determinateness. This is what we've, we've looked at the logical structure of earlier, this self-othering process that involves um, becoming determinate and sort of taking this back into itself. We can look at this in, in, in a multiple uh, different, you know, uh, modes. Uh, abstraction turns out to be not just identity, pure identity, but also non-identity because the thing is not the same thing as the abstraction of it, but it's related to it. Um, all of these give us a fuller and fuller conception of the thing. They, they do contribute knowledge to us. Now, he says, as the self-moving concrete gestalt or form or shape makes itself into a determinateness, Here's where it gets really interesting. It raises itself into logical form. So another way of looking at this would be that when we are actually, as phenomenologists, as, as you know, those engaging in this uh, historical inquiry into consciousness and consciousness as objects, when we're actually being attentive, when we're not just sort of superimposing our own preconceived notions onto this, then the content itself will give us clues about how it ought to be schematized, how it ought to be arranged. And you don't have to be Hegel to figure this out. I mean, all you really have to do is be involved with any sort of craft work and, and you know, where there's material, and you'll realize very quickly that whatever you came to the material with, whatever preconceived ideas about how it's going to work and how it ought to work, um, if those happen to align with the realities of the material, good for you. Otherwise, the material is going to kick it back to you and say, I'm not doing that. I'm doing what I want to do. And if you want to come along for the ride, here's what you can do. I mean, you can think about carving, for example, wood carving. You carve generally with the grain. Um, you, you know, you can, of course, chisel against the grain, and there's all sorts of, you know, special cuts you can do. But if you're, if you're trying to just approach the material from the outside and say, you're going to do exactly this, well, you may as well just be pouring concrete then, right? Or doing plastic uh, molding, rather than actually working with something that has its own grain, its own texture, its own structure to it. And so Hegel is saying things will give us their, their logical structure. So he says, um, concrete existence is just this movement and is directly a logical existence. We're experiencing this long before we, even if we never decide to, come to Hegel's phenomenology or even philosophy in general. This is part of what it is to be human, is to be attentive to things out there, sometimes, you know, it's, it's superimposing our own conceptions onto him. He's not saying never do that, but he is saying that a lot of our concrete existence is learning from the objects, hey, this is how I'm supposed to be understood. This is the kind of thing that I am. Um, so he says it's, it's unnecessary to clothe the content in an external logical formalism. The content is, in its very nature, the transition into such formalism but a formalism that ceases to be external. So see, Hegel's not against formalism per se. He's against formalism that doesn't take its cues from that which is to be formalized, that is the objects, the, the content that is supposed to be grasped for consciousness by means of the, the notion. 
So he says, the form is the innate development of the concrete content itself. As these things expose themselves to us and, and we engage with them, uh, and many of these things, by the way, are human realities, not just, you say, material things or natural objects. Um, we are ourselves learning how to conceptualize them, how to bring them into the notion. And this is not just us, you know, sort of sitting back and ideas popping in our head, Hegel thinks. We're actually in a relationship with the thing and learning about what it is in that thing. Now, it exists for us in our thought, as we pointed out earlier. This is an idealism. So that, you know, it's not as if the alien thing is way out there and is, you know, we're, we're sort of realizing what's inside of it that we would never otherwise have had access to. But it's not just all on our side. It's, it's also on the side of the thing. This nature of scientific method, which consists partly in not being separate from the content and partly in spontaneously determining the rhythm of its movement, has, as already remarked, its proper exposition in speculative philosophy. Of course, what has been said here does express the notion, but cannot count for more than an anticipatory assurance. Its truth does not lie in this partly narrative exposition, and is therefore just as little refuted by asserting the contrary, by calling to mind and recounting conventional ideas, as if they were established in familiar truths, or by dishing up something new with the assurance that it comes from the shrine of inner divine intuition. A reception of this kind is usually the first reaction on the part of knowing to something unfamiliar. It resists it in order to save its own freedom and its own insight, its own authority from the alien authority. For this is the guise in which what is newly encountered first appears. And to get rid of the appearance that something has been learned and of the sort of shame this is supposed to involve. Similarly, where the unfamiliar is greeted with applause, the reaction is of the same kind and consists in what another sphere would take the form of ultra-revolutionary speech and action. In section 57, Hegel is going to once again, you know, contrast the scientific method that's entailed in speculative philosophy, in dialectical, you know, conceptual philosophy, against a, a few other rivals, you could say, that are, that are prevalent not only in his culture but also in our own. And we'll come to those in a moment. But I actually want to skip ahead a little bit towards the, the bottom of the paragraph because he's talking about something that happens when we encounter forms of thought that are unfamiliar to us. He says that um, a reception of this kind is usually the first reaction on the part of knowing, so somebody who already is engaged in you know, knowledge, some systematization, some putting things together, their first reaction to something unfamiliar. And not just unfamiliar in the sense of, well, here's a new content and I, I, you know, I haven't encountered this before. You know, we'll take a very trivial example. Um, bubble gum. You know, when I was a kid, there were just a few kinds of gum at first. And then there was this bubble gum explosion. And, you know, not only did we have bubble gum flavor, but also cherry flavor and grape flavor. And we thought this is so great, you know, Bubblicious and Hubba Bubba came out. And then after a while, they started going hog wild with that and just, you know, introducing all sorts of crazy flavors. And, you know, some of us uh, said, that's enough. There's too many crazy flavors, you know. Um, peach, that's fine. But this, this thing over here, I don't even know what, that, what, what that's supposed to be or what it's supposed to taste like. I think you just mixed a bunch of chemicals together and, you know, and they add... Uh, industry, they say, throw it at the wall and see if it sticks. That's what they, they, they did. And so I could be, you know, I've got knowledge about bubble gum. And this is not, you know, uh, scientific knowledge in the sense that I'm, you know, analyzing it in the lab. But, you know, experiential knowledge, right? I'm a kid who, you know, would shell out um, money so there's a stake in it for different flavors of bubble gum. And, and we would compare notes among the kids. So there's a process of inquiry going on there, right? And, you know, since I'm paying money for it, it actually matters to me. If I'm going to buy this pack, I want to know that that's actually going to taste like something decent. And, you know, maybe you, you 
somebody else buys a pack, you know, I'll swap you one for, for one, because uh, the packs always had five uh, big cubes of gum in them. And now you try it and you're like, what, what the hell is this? Um, that's new content, right? It's not requiring you to sort of radically change your way of understanding things. It's just new content. It's, it's adding a little bit to your knowledge base in this, this one area. Now, there's other kinds of knowledge, there's other objects of knowledge, which call more into question. You can think of them as having sort of a ripple effect, where this is new, and if this is new, and it's something real, and it's something I do need to take into account, that's going to call into question a lot of these, these other things as well. Um, think about when you first tell somebody about the, the notion of emotional intelligence. Um, and, you, you know, you can break it down for them while it consists in being able to identify your emotions, being able to identify other people's emotions, having some rudimentary knowledge of how emotions work, you know, being able to sort of empathize with other people, project how they're going to feel. You know, there's a whole bunch of different components to this. Once you start to learn about this, people often have those, you know, light bulb going on moments and they say, oh, yeah, that, now that I understand this, I've been misunderstanding this stuff over here all this time. Now, that's a positive reaction. Hegel talks about negative reactions that people have to that sort of thing as well. He says, um, it resists it in order to save its own freedom and its own insight. A lot of times when people encounter a new way of looking at things, they want to, they, they say, if it can't fit into what I already know, I don't want to know about it. Why? Because it makes them feel unfree. And it makes them feel like they don't know what they're actually doing. And the, the more that people have invested in self, what Hegel would call self-certainty, Gewissheit, um, the more damaging this is to the stance that they're currently in, the more you know frightening it is for their, their shape of consciousness, to the point where it could actually you know induce such anxiety that it, it counts as something like the you know the fear of death that's going to be talked about later on in, in the, the self consciousness section. Um, so Hegel is isolating two elements here. He's saying they want to preserve their own freedom. Because there is a freedom in thinking that he's going to talk about a lot in the next sections. And they want to pre preserve their own insight, their own authority from the alien authority. The alien authority, the new way of looking at things is coming in as an alien authority and saying, well, you didn't, you didn't have it all figured out. And as a matter of fact, we're probably going to have to retool quite a bit of your stock here. Um, and, you know, it's going to be a bit disruptive for a while. How long? Well, we don't know. We're going to have to see how, just how, how badly off you actually are. Um, so they want to, like he says, get rid of the appearance that something has been learned and of the sort of shame or embarrassment, uh, feeling lower that this is supposed to involve. Learning requires humility. You know, the, the Latin word docility literally means teachability. Somebody who is not docile, somebody who is not open and receptive, really can't be taught an awful lot. Certainly nothing that, that matters, you know, uh, particularly. And oftentimes we, we need to shake them up a bit in order to be able to do that. And speculative philosophy is going to shake them up. So he says... Um, Speculative philosophy works with the notion. I'm giving you an outline here. I'm giving you sort of a, a narration. I'm not saying that this is the whole shebang. So don't read the preface and say, well, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? We'll get to that later on. Um, but I'm giving you the main, the main outlines. What are people going to oppose to that? He says, well, you know, two things quite, quite common. common uh, conventional ideas, things that are already established, taken as being true, as, um, you know, sort of environment that we have to work in. Well, this, this isn't really, you know, worth doing because um, my philosophy teacher told me that Hegel's too hard and incomprehensible and nobody really works with him anyway except for a few weird, wacky continental people. Um, well, that'd be an example of a conventional idea. A lot of people do have that idea. Um, can you do anything with it? Yeah, you can reject Hegel and save yourself the time of actually reading something. 
Is that an adequate approach to things? Not really. Um, you, you probably need to check, it. I mean, if you're actually curious about whether there's anything to this, you actually have to spend the time, do the work, and think it through. And then you're probably going to find out that those conventional ideas not only are false, but actually have a place within the phenomenology where Hegel can actually tell you how and why they're false. That's one of the, the things that's interesting about his perspective. Also, people like, like Alistair McIntyre, who is in a certain way Hegelian in what he does, influenced through Collingwood, of course. Um, another thing that people do is they come up with something new, something that's a little bit easier to, to, to grasp, but doesn't have the same graspability or comprehensibility, the same begrifflichkeit. Begriffen is to grasp, right? To, to, to sink your claws into, to, to, to get a hold of. And there's some things that appear superficially graspable. They sound plausible and they sound cool quite often, but really there's not a lot to them. And, you know, people will say, well, you either got to get it or you don't get it, man. Um, and that's, you know, what Hegel's calling intuition. He says they, they come up with something new by intuition. Um, if we want to be very facetious, we, you know, we talk about people pulling things out of their, their rear ends. That's what he's talking about there. And those are both uh, responses that people will have so that they don't have to do this kind of work over here. What, therefore, is important in the study of science is that one should take on oneself the strenuous effort of the notion. This requires attention to the notion as such, to the simple determinations, that is, of being as such, being for itself, self-identity, and so forth. For these are pure self-movements, such as could be called souls, if their notion did not designate something higher than soul. The habit of picture thinking, when it is interrupted by the notion, finds it just as irksome as does formalistic thinking that argues back and forth in thoughts that have no actuality. That habit should be called material thinking, a contingent consciousness that is absorbed only in material stuff, and therefore finds it hard work to lift the thinking self clear of such matter and to be with itself alone. At the opposite extreme, argumentation is freedom from all content and a sense of vanity towards it. What is looked for here is the effort to give up this freedom. And instead of being the arbitrary mo arbitrarily moving principle of the content, to sink this freedom in the content, letting it move spontaneously of its own nature, by the self, as its own self, and then to contemplate this movement. This refusal to intrude into the imminent rhythm of the notion, either arbitrarily or with wisdom obtained from elsewhere, constitutes a restraint which is itself an essential moment of the notion. In section 58, Hegel is going to contrast three different approaches against each other. Um, these are ones that actually play a very important role, you might say, in his history of, of thought. And Vorstellung, um, or Vorstellen, the, the verb or the, or the noun, they play an important uh, place along the way. He also identifies what he's calling here argument, argumentation or raisonieren um, with sort of the, the philosophy of the understanding. So if you actually go on to look through Hegel's other works, you're going to find these playing a very important role as preliminary steps that don't realize that they're preliminary steps and that's why they, they end up being insufficient. So he tells us that science, Wissenschaft, requires the strenuous effort of the notion. Um, it means that we have to work not only to, you know, penetrate into the content and allow the content to speak to us, to dictate its own categories to us, but we have to be even more rigorous with respect to this. It can't just be a sort of, man, the, you know, the ocean's going to talk to me about what kind of thing it is. We, ha we have to conceptualize it. We have to try to, to grasp it. It's, a, it's an active process both ways. And so he actually brings up some metaphysical determinations in this, what he calls simple determinations. Um, 
uh, examples of these are being in itself. What is being in itself? Well, that requires a, an analysis. Um, and it turns out, you know, uh, here's a, the punchline for everything Hegelian. Everything that you analyze always turns out to be something quite different than what you originally thought it was. So being in, in itself, being for itself, self-identity. Uh, he says these are pure self-movements such as could be called souls because they are self-moving, right? The soul is self-moving in traditional philosophy. Uh, if their notion did not de designate something higher than, than soul. Now, he doesn't talk about this, but I think that it, we also ought to read into the strenuousness of the effort of uh, the notion that we're also entering into the content of the notion, its concreteness. He's just been talking about this. He perhaps doesn't think that he needs to talk about it at this point, you know, re-emphasize it, but I think that given the, the nature of this, you know, sort of course, it's worth emphasizing that these two go along with each other. Um, these simple determinations, uh, like being in itself, are getting used to illuminate the concrete actualities, the experiential things that we're running into. That's the content of the notion. Now, he says science has to do a, a lot of work to develop a, a you know, sort of systematic understanding of these things that it can actually justify to itself. And he opposes two other types of thinking to this. So he talks about picture thinking first, and he says, the habit of picture thinking, when it's interrupted by the notion, finds it irksome, as does formalistic thinking that argues back and forth in thoughts that have no actuality. That's, that's more the raison Um Now, picture thinking is when people actually have a very determinate understanding of things. And this can be very important things. You know, an example of this is in the lectures on the, the philosophy of religion. Picture thinking actually takes you quite a ways, but we have to get beyond that to, to conceptual thinking towards uh, uh, the, the notion, the concept. And what he highlights here is the fact that picture thinking thinks in terms of images. Um, these don't necessarily have to be visual images. These could be uh, verbalizations. These could be things that are, are heard, um, imaginations, you know. And he talks about it in terms of habit. And he says it should be called material thinking a contingent consciousness that is absorbed only in material stuff, therefore finds it hard work to lift the thinking self clear of such matter and to be with itself alone, to think in, in these sorts of uh, determinations of the concept. And he's right about this. Very often when people are doing picture thinking, take for example the notion of freedom. People have a very determinate conception of freedom. They belong to a political party or a political movement. And here we're dealing with an idea, but it's also probably tied in with some, some emotional resonances, with some very determinate, you know, understandings of this is freedom, that's not freedom. And then they encounter somebody else who has a, a different conception of freedom, because there's, there's multiple conceptions. And they find themselves unable to engage in the back and forth and, and, and very long. And they find themselves having to sort of just reinforce their position. They find others who, who agree with them, who are part of that community. Uh, you know, we understand freedom. They don't, they don't get it. And you can see this playing itself out in American politics all the time, and, you know, right and left, and, and the coalitions that represent them, the Republican and Democratic parties. Both of them have, have you know... Uh, very partial understandings of what freedom, choice, common good, any of these sorts of ideas actually are. Hegel would say that they're, both of them are actually deeply mired in all sorts of varieties of picture thinking. On the other hand, critique, argumentation, what he's calling raisonnier in here, offers a kind of freedom from content, but it, in a certain way it goes too far. It, it is a freedom that, he says, actually leads to a kind of vanity, a sense of vanity towards it. it. It can never commit itself to anything. He says, what is looked for here is the effort to give up this freedom. So, you know, what's missing here on the side of, of picture thinking, uh, on Vorstellung, is it, it hasn't done the work to free itself from its contingency. Over here, 
there's the you know freedom to say, well, it's all contingent, and that itself can end up being a sort of paralyzing stance to take, uh, by which you know a person doesn't progress because they can anything that, that comes along they can negate, they can say, well, that that's not everything, that's you know got some flaws to it, and then they never actually do the the work of of jumping in and seeing where things actually go, and then looking at it critically again. So he says, um, what they need to do is to, to sink this freedom in the content, letting it move spontaneously of its own nature, by the self as its own self, then to contemplate its movement. So what you could think of is, I don't want to say, you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, because it's not so simple as that. You know, which of these is the thesis? Neither one is actually the thesis, and both of them are the thesis. But what... Um, Hegel is calling science is supposed to do is combine what's actually good in both of these and strip away the elements that are, are bad in, in both of them and attain something that actually gets us along further. So he says, this refusal to intrude into the imminent rhythm of the notion either arbitrarily or with a wisdom obtained from elsewhere constitutes a restraint which is itself an essential moment of uh, the notion. So it's, it's not just, you know, go full bore and we're going to figure everything out. There is a rhythm to phenomenology. There is a restraint that's required. A, it's sort of like, you know, if we want to do some picture thinking here and we think about it in terms of eating and, and you, know, diet, you know, dietetics and... Um, managing one's, one's food intake, you know. You, you sit there and you eat, and if you eat fast, you're probably, A, not going to digest stuff very well, and B, not tell how much you're eating and, and probably overeat. So you, you eat a little bit more slowly, and then you just actually start to notice the flavors of things. Um, you say, oh, that's, that actually has an aftertaste. Wait, that's got two aftertastes. Oh, now I see why this dish goes with this one, because they actually pair well. What we're talking about as begriff here, concept, starts to unfold itself to us when we're receptive to it and show a kind of restraint and don't insist on, you know, relying on just one of these things, but actually start piecing things together. And that can take a long time. Um, I, I'm perhaps less optimistic than Hegel about, you know, the end point for that and see it as an ongoing process that's, that's uh, never quite finished myself. But um, I do think it's an advance, especially at this moment, for him to criticize picture thinking, to tell us about that, and to counterpose to it this raisonnier. Um, 